Well, good afternoon. Those who don't know me, I'm Peter Minette. Those who do know me, I'm Peter Minette. And this is Chong Jia. It's a great pleasure of mine to introduce him to you if you don't know him already. Chong came to Rasmus in August 2017 and completed a master's degree at the end of 2019. His research topic was uh, assessing the difficulties in making <coughs> accurate determinations of the sea surface temperature in the Arctic from infrared radiometers on satellites. And this is a really tricky problem that has vexed the remote sensing community for decades. Chong made good progress, so much so that uh, a revised algorithm he developed was uh, adopted by NASA, who were about to start reprocessing about 40 years worth of satellite data. So as a master's student, Chong has made an important contribution to the uh, scientific community. He then went home to China at the beginning of 2020 and thereby hangs a tail because when he was there COVID hit and he was there not for a short family visit but until September 2021 right so he actually started his PhD remotely um, he spent some time at the Ocean University of China in Qingdao which is where he uh, earned his first degree, his bachelor's degree. So he was awarded a University of Miami Graduate School Fellowship for his PhD research, and we're going to hear about some of that this afternoon. His master's research was published in a paper in the Remote Sensing of Environment journal, which as many of you know is the premier journal for uh, satellite observations of the Earth. His PhD work was focused on interpreting measurements from sail drones, which are robotic vehicles which were sent into the Arctic in beginning in 2019. And from that work, he has got three more publications. As a bit of a distraction, he looked at the effects of the Tonga submarine volcanic eruption, which is, was the largest, or still is, the largest hydration of the stratosphere in the history of satellite measurements in the satellite era going back decades. And uh, I anticipate that that I anticipated that this would have a huge detrimental effect on satellite retrievals of sea surface temperature and Chong proved me wrong and that was another paper so we're on the point of submitting yet another paper and Chong is working on the next one but at this point I'll sit down and hand over to Chong Thank you Professor for the so detailed introduction for me I think I can start my uh, one-hour seminar. And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my one-hour seminar. And today I would like to um, overview part of my, uh, but it actually should be the main body of my uh, PhD research, which is the uh, characteristics of the sea surface temperatures in the Arctic derived from measurements from both cell drones and satellites. So I'd like to um, develop my presentation from the uh, background introduction, then the three main parts of my research, and finally I will uh, summarize some part of my other research work. So as we all know, the SST, which is known as the sea surface temperature, is a very, very important parameter in the uh, climate change study and the weather predictions or air sea interactions. So we don't have to uh, stress this anymore, but we should know that the infrared satellite remote sensing could provide a 
a frequent long-term and global coverage of the sea surface skin temperature. And for the Arctic, or to say the northern high latitude regions, it is particularly difficult for the infrared satellites to retrieve high accuracy uh, skin SST due to the extremely cold and dry atmospheric conditions, uh, which uh, challenge the atmospheric correction and retrieval algorithms. But the infrared radiometers mounted on the ship or the other platforms uh, could uh, provide appropriate and uh, high accurate uh, skin SST for the satellite data uh, accuracy assessment and also the studies of the sea surface and the air sea interactions. However, the amount of the available in situ skin SST data is still very limited in the both number and the spatial coverage, especially at high latitudes. So for this uh, motivation of the study, I would like to introduce the first part, which is the high latitude sea surface skin temperatures derived from the cell drone infrared measurements. And this part of work uh, has been published uh, in the IEEE transactions on geoscience and remote sensing. So first of all, I would like to share a picture I took uh, at the uh, Ocean Sciences meeting this year in New Orleans, and I'm sure uh, some of you must also uh, were still there, uh, also were there. And this is what a, a cell drone uh, really looks like. So it's like, um, actually it's like, it's much larger than I uh, image. But, uh, but, so what is a, a, a cell drone? Actually cell drone is a, uh, a very big capable uh, and crude surface vehicle carrying a suit of uh, meteorological and oceanography instruments. And it uses the uh, wind power for the propulsion and uses the uh, solar power for the, um, for, the, uh, for the instrument. So here uh, on the uh, left and the figure shows the uh, configuration of the uh, cell drone with part of the uh, sensors installed on, on the uh, cell drone and crew surface vehicle, uh, which uh, are, were used in uh, our study. And the right uh, photo shows the uh, two of the cell drones uh, at the, um, the starting points uh, in the Dutch Harbor, Alaska. So in uh, 2019, from May uh, 15th to October 11th, uh, six uh, cell drones uh, were deployed from the Dutch Harbor, Alaska, and uh, navigating through the Barents Strait to the uh, Chukchi Sea and up to 75 degree now, and then come back with a, a 150 uh, days round trip. So. Here we uh, use the uh, two NASA funded cell drones, cell drone 1036 and cell drone 1037, with a <coughs> pair of infrared uh, radio uh, parameters on the deck at 0.8 uh, meter height, which is shown in the blue circle uh, in the uh, figure A on the right. And there is also an uh, additional one at 2.25 uh, meter. Uh, which is uh, in the green box. So this uh, infrared parameter system could uh, provide measurements to derive the uh, skin SST. So the sea viewing sensors were Hytronics CT15, which uh, is given in the figure C on the right, and the sky viewing sensor was a CT09, which uh, is uh, shown in figure B on the right. So the uh, main principle of deriving the skin SST is to uh, compensate the uh, reflected uh, downwelling radiance at the surface into the uh, sea viewing sensor. So we assume the transmitters from the surface to our sensor of United, and we also consider 
uh, b due to the uh, low installation height. And also we must consider the surface um, emissivity effect. Therefore, the uh, derivation of the skin SST could be expressed uh, as equation one. And also due to a, a relatively wide range of the uh, spectral response of the uh, effect parameters installed on the cell drum, from, mainly from eight to 40 micrometer, we also have to consider the relative spectral response function, which uh, is shown uh, in the plot on the right. And we should note that uh, the four <coughs> CT15 uh, parameter has very similar RSR function with three mostly overlapped together. However, for the uh, CT09, parameter, the uh, RSR function is significantly different from those of uh, CT15. So therefore, uh, we should uh, evaluate this uh, inaccuracy from the different RSR functions later. So considering the uh, RSR function, equation 1 then becomes to equation 2. So before deriving the skin SST, another thing uh, must to be considered is the viewing geometry and the calculation of the emissivity. Since uh, when uh, during the uh, cell drone cruises, the cell drone could uh, be tilt, uh, could tilted or like to uh, pitch uh, with a very large angle due to the wave or strong winds. Therefore, we establish the uh, three-dimensional rota rotation matrix, considering the real angle, pitch angle, and row angles. So here, the theta zero is the uh, standard viewing angle of the uh, sensors for an upright cell drum, which is uh, minus plus uh, 50 degree with the down and up looking infrared parameters on the deck. So therefore, the effective incidence angle theta e could uh, be uh, calculated uh, as fun uh, function three. And then we use a built-in infrared sea surface emissivity model in the RTTAR uh, model, which is a very fast radiative transfer model to determine the sea surface emissivity including the genius angle and wind speed dependence also with a uh, dependence on the skin SST in the 10 to 12 micron window. So after doing all of this, now we would like to evaluate the, um, the inaccuracy uh, due to the uh, RSR function difference between the uh, uplooking uh, CT09 and the downlooking CT15 infrared parameters. So we use uh, accurate long, uh, line by line radiative transfer models to, uh, to uh, conduct the simulation. And we also use the uh, MERA2 reanalysis data as the model input uh, by averaging the uh, MERA2. Uh, atmospheric profiles uh, monthly in our target uh, research area, which is 50 degree now to 75 degree now, and 180 degree west to 140 degree west uh, with the uh, land mask. And we fix the uh, satellite viewing angle at 50 degree, and we run the um, LBL RTM simulation from May to October 2019 and their clear sky conditions. So here is the plot shows the um, radiance difference and as well as the calculated brightness temperature difference by the uh, LBL RTM simulations from May to October. And for the, uh, due to the uh, RSR function difference between CT09 and CT15 for the cell drone 1036 and cell drone 1037 cruises. The, bar, the bars are the uh, radiance difference and the line and the, the dots represent the uh, corresponding brightness temperature difference. 
So we could uh, clearly see that for Seldon 1036, the CTO9 generally measures the uh, T sky, which is the uh, sky temperature uh, 0.15 wa warmer than it would have been measured by CT15 under clear sky conditions, and which is a value could be ignored. Whereas for the Seldon 1037, it could reach up to 2K colder than um, the CT15 on average. Uh, causing resulting in a 0.025k error in the derived skin SST. So now we would like to evaluate another uh, source of the uh, inaccuracy, which is the viewing angle. As we know, if the uh, the uh, the tilting effect uh, of the children could cause the uh, viewing angle of the up-looking CT09 and the down-looking CT15 a difference viewing angle. So this difference viewing angle would also introduce some inaccuracy in the derived skin SST. So to examine this effect uh, due to the pitching of the cell room, we set the input zenith angle from 0 to 70 degree with the increments of 10 degree still based on the LBL RTM simulations. So here is the, uh, the right plot. Uh, the right plot shows the uh, numerical simulations for each month. So uh, as we can see that the, uh, the sensitivity of the uh, sky temperature to the genius angle is especially uh, large when the genius angle is beyond uh, 40 or to say 50, de uh, 50 degree. So therefore we have to uh, limit the range of the sea and sky uh, viewing angles to, uh, to be used uh, within 45 degree to 55 degree and also we have to uh, uh, limit the pitch angles within plus and minus 1.5 degree, which is shown in the uh, shadow area in the plot on the right. So the uh, plot on the uh, lower right shows the well, if the uncertainty of a sky, measured, uh, sky temperature from in, uh, infrared parameter CT09 is 2.5k, the corresponding error in the uh, skin SST under different sky temperatures and also under different uh, viewing angles. So based on this plot, we can evaluate due to our limitations as shown in the shadow area, the angle discrepancy has been finally controlled within 3 degrees and the resulting sky temperature measurements uncertainty are within 1.5k, which could introduce an uncertainty of 0.2k in the derived skin SST under clear sky conditions. So note that we uh, didn't conduct the uh, numerical simulation under cloud skies, and we argue that the um, even though the magnitude of the um, of the error in the uh, uncertainty in the skin SST with the same uncertainty of sky temperature for cloud sky conditions would be larger than under the clear sky conditions. We argue that uh, the zenith angle sensitivity of the sky temperature would be much lower than uh, under cloudy skies due to the uh, lower height of the uh, top of the uh, atmosphere. So, therefore, the uh, magnitude of this part of inaccuracy um, under cloudy skies should be comparable to those under clear skies. And on the other hand, the uh, mean object for those derived skin SST is to uh, evaluate the accuracy of the satellite, infrared satellite derived skin SST, which uh, is known as only uh, could be valid uh, under clear sky conditions. So now we uh, summarize the uncertainty budget 
uh, of the uh, skin SST. So there could be three main components of the uncertainty of the derived skin SST, which is this first one is the sea surface emissivity. And we assume it is very small and negligible due to our well-determined <coughs> building geometry. And the second, the third one, come from the uh, instrument, uh, from the sea and sky viewing infrared parameters. So for the sky viewing uh, parameters, it could uh, include both the instrument uncertainty and the viewing angle uh, uncertainty. And note that the, um, the uh, RSR function difference introduced the, uh, the, the systematic uh, bias rather than an uncertainty, which is not included here. So this table shows the manufacturer's stated uh, uh, uncertainty for both two types of the uh, parameters. And uh, the total uncertainty from the last two terms in blue is no more than 0 0.024 for both cell groups after our evaluation. And we should note that according to the manufacturer specifications, the stated uncertainty of CT15 is plus or minus 0.5k and plus 0.7% uh, of the difference between the target and instrument temperature, which is uh, too large to uh, be accepted. <coughs> So therefore, um, we want to um, find a way to evaluate the actual uncertainty of the derived skin SST. Uh, due to the lack of the uh, pre-deployment uh, calibration in the lab, we have to find an alternative way, which is to evaluate the skin SST uh, uncertainty comparing by comparing the skin SST difference with the subsurface SST difference measured by the zebra temperature loggers at the 0.3 meters on board the cell drone between the two cell drones 1036 and 1037 with a very small separation which is 10 kilometer. So then we have the delta SST means the uh, SST skin between the two cell drones within 10 kilometer, including an uncertainty term UC and the delta skin SST representing the geophysical variability. And due to the high accuracy of the temperature logger, uh, we assume the UC uh, is, could be ignored, then equivalent to only contains the uh, geophysical variability for the uh, 0.3 meter SST. And then to keep the uh, to minimize uh, to uh, to uh, minimize the um, the diurnal warming effects and to keep the uh, consistent of the upper motion uh, st thermal structure for the uh, two cell drones, so we remove the diurnal heating signals and to make the uh, equation three whole. And then we can calculate the uncertainty you see by uh, using the uh, this formula four with under the uh, ninety five percent confidence, uh, which use a factor as one point nine six uh, times the uh, robust standard deviation of the uh, difference between the delta SST skin and delta SST point three point three meter, and the uh, the scatter plot for this two uh, SST difference, it's given in the, the figure on the right. So finally, we have the, and finally we assume the uncertainty from both two cell drones are identical. And then we have the uh, estimated uncertainty of the derived skin SST as 0.12K, as given in equation five. So this is a value much lower than the uh, stated uh, uncertainty in the manufacturer's specification, and which is, uh, which is uh, considered uh, to be uh, too conservative. So finally, we would like to uh, evaluate the systematic error analysis of the skin SST. As I mentioned, due to the lack of the uh, pre-deployment um, lab calibration, so we, um, the, we 
asked the Wintronix team, which is the U.S. agent for the Hytronix, uh, calibrated the one CT15, but unfortunately not the one uh, either on the 1036 or 1037 in 2022. 20, uh, so their results show that at the black body target temperature of one degree was uh, the uh, the error is plus 0.09 K and minus 0.07 K at 30 uh, Celsius degree. So if we assume a monotonic temperature dependence of the arrow, the measurement arrow at the temperature experience in our 2019 Arctic cruises are about 0.06 K in average. So there is also another strong evidence to indicate there is no significant systematic bias, which is if we compare the SST at uh, 1.7 meter, which is the deepest SST measurements by the cell drone temperature loggers during the night time, which as a function of the 10 meter wind speed and the uh, asymptotic line of our fitted current to the cell drone data, only different from the previous pub, uh, the published work uh, Dolan et al. in uh, 2002 by uh, 0 0.01 K. So it would be very unlikely if there was a significant systematic in the seldom derived skin SST. So here are some take-home points. Uh, in one word, we have prove, proved that the uh, accuracy of the uh, seldom derived skin SST is sufficient to be used for the uh, scientific research. So therefore, uh, we would like to conduct the uh, second part of the our research, which is the uh, skin significant diurnal warming events and the ocean warm skin signals observed by cell drone at high latitudes. And those uh, part of work includes two publications, uh, which uh, one is uh, in the JGR Ocean and the other one is in the GRL. So the data we used uh, in not only include the skin SST retrieved from the uh, uh, the cell drones mentioned introduced above, uh, definitely with the uh, rigorous uh, quality control by limiting the uh, the the the, the uh, pitching angle of the platform and also removing those measurements close to the sea ice, and also we we introduced the subsurface SST taken by the several instruments by Seldon, including two CTDs and seven temperature loggers along the queue of the uh, Seldon. And also we use the uh, meteorological variables from Seldon, including the wind speed, air temperature, uh, relative humidity, surface pressure, and the uh, PAR uh, to derive the, um, the surface solar radiation. And since uh, there is uh, um, uh, absent of the, uh, the long wave radiation measurement, we have to take the uh, ERA5 reanalysis data for this part of the uh, data to uh, establish the uh, sea surface heat flux budget calculation. So uh, as we know that the, um, the SST is not a unique definition due to its compli uh, complicated uh, upper ocean thermal structure. So this, uh, there is uh, always a nearly, uh, there is a, uh, nearly always a, serm, uh, a thin skin, a skin layer uh, resulting in a cooler skin SST than the uh, the subsurface uh, SSD due to the uh, heat loss from the ocean to the atmosphere, uh, supported supplied by the uh, conductivity uh, heat flow from the um, the uh, the skin layer be uh, beneath the skin layer, uh, including the sensible and latent heat flux and also the net long wave heat flux radiation. So. Also, uh, during the daytime, under the light winds, there could also uh, be a diurnal warming signals uh, with, uh, due to the strong insulation 
at the surface and there's a, a light winds uh, resulting the weak turbulent mixing in the uh, mixed layer beneath the uh, ocean thermal skin layer. So here are the uh, some formulae to um, determine the uh, definition of the skin SST consisting of the uh, both the cool skin and the uh, the uh, diurnal warming signals if present, and also the uh, surface uh, heat flux budget determination. So. Another thing is that um, the cool skin, which uh, could be uh, could be converted into the warm skin, which is rarely reported previously, uh, by uh, changing the sign of the QC, which uh, will be introduced later. So, firstly, we would like to study the uh, some diurnal warming uh, events. And before that, we have to determine the magnitude of the cool skin effect. And we use the uh, wind speed um, dependence of the cool skin temperature difference uh, parameterization reference uh, to the uh, skin SST at uh, 1.7 meter and pr parameterized as the formulas given here. And uh, we, this plot shows the family of the uh, the uh, fitted curve for this study and also some uh, in some previous published paper. Uh, we can see that the asymptotic line is uh, pretty, lines are, uh, the values are pretty close to each other. However, under the light winds, the uh, behavior of the uh, cool skins are totally different, uh, which could be due to the uh, different date, uh, the, the, um, the, the different study area or the different study period in uh, each uh, research. So on the right plot, it's the some um, strong, after the determination of the cool skin, then we can calculate the magnitude of the warm skin, uh, the, the, sorry, the, di the diurnal warming. So we find some uh, large diurnal warming events as given in the plot on the right and with the uh, colored by the wind speed and also a black curve of the uh, solar radiation at the surface. So it's clearly, shown, it's, it's, uh, clearly shown that the large warming events uh, mainly uh, greater than 2K result from uh, strong insulation and very low wind speeds. And we can also find some diurnal warming even persisted from one day into the next, such as uh, on the uh, June 15 to 16th and July 9, uh, 9, uh, 7 to 9 July, due, mainly due to the midnight sun in the Arctic. So now we'd like to present some uh, specific Diurnal warming events. <coughs> so this is a uh, diurnal warming events I uh, identified on mean, uh, May nineteenth. Uh, so we can see there is a large peak uh, reach up to five k in Figure A, and um, the. Uh, magnitude of the warming suddenly decreased due to the decrease of the incoming insulation. So there is also a secondary peak uh, at about like uh, uh, 15 p.m. Uh, at the local time uh, due to the uh, a little bit uh, increased uh, insulation. But due to the increase of the wind speed then the uh, diurnal warming totally vanished. So uh, figure B shows the uh, vertical temperature profile at uh, each depth. So we can find that the uh, subsurface SST has a, like a significantly uh, slow response than the skin layer. 
Um, and figure C shows the calculated sensible and latent heat flux defined as the uh, positive downward. So, which, uh, so we can see that the uh, surface air temperature is always cooler than the uh, sea surface temperature during all the time, which means the uh, ocean is, uh, is doing a heat loss on May 19th. And according to the image uh, taken by the camera on board the cell room, we find that before this strong diurnal warming events, there, there was a pre precipitation rainfall events. So we think that this rain will have lowered the salinity of the, uh, the uh, surface layer and creating a thin layer at the sea surface with, with, with very low salinity and trapped the heat within this thin layer and resulting in the slow response uh, beneath the uh, in the mixed layer, and also we run the uh, the the uh, NOAA Hasley model to uh, study like the uh, the trajectory back, backward trajectory of the air. So the cold air um, is was shown uh, coming coming from the northeast uh, Siberia, according to Figure E. So similarly, another uh, specific diurnal warming event is the uh, the diurnal warming from June 15th to 16th, which uh, persisted uh, over one more than one day. So this time, the uh, peak of the diurnal warming is still reached up to 5k, but with according to Figure B, with uh, like a more um, more oscillations uh, in the uh, the vertical uh, temperature profiles, and uh, uh, the calculated sensible and light heat flux shows there uh, that sometimes the uh, the surface air even warmer than the skin SST uh, could result in the uh, sensible and latent heat flux from the atmosphere to the ocean. So the camera shows that the um, before this uh, warming events, the uh, the uh, cell drone is was very close to the uh, the marginal sea ice zone. So we infer that a less salty surface layer was created by the melting sea ice. Also, good uh, supporting the uh, formation of this uh, upper ocean uh, thermal stratification. So right by running the NOAA high split model, the warm air, uh, we find that the warm air originated from the lower atmosphere over the Arctic Ocean, but was heated by its passage over land, as shown in figure E. So, uh, finally, we run some uh, model comparisons uh, using uh, those two uh, pro prognostic diurnal warmings, DB05 and AK17. So, uh, both numerical models are sensitive to the wind speed and uh, drop too rapidly in the late afternoon. And DB05 uh, significantly overestimate the magnitude of the diurnal warming as shown in the, uh, the yellow curve in figure A. So, and also, the both model fail to simulate the, uh, the warming signals holding beyond one day. So, and uh, figure B shows that uh, the, um, the simulated warming uh, arrow for both model is large under the low and uh, moderate wind speed and also the uh, arrow is largest uh, during the uh, the uh, noon and in the uh, early afternoon for both model so the next part is the uh, warm skins mentioned about 
So theoretically, the euro cool skin can be converted to the warm skin by reversing the sign of the QC, consisting of the sensible Latin and uh, long the net long wave uh, radiation. So the total net heat flux is from atmosphere to the ocean. So this plot shows the time series of Seldon 1036 uh, of the calculated sensible Latin and net long wave radiation and also the sum of uh, these each of the three components. So we can find if here we define the heat flux as uh, the positive downward. So we can find during some short period of time, the uh, sign of the each component are positive. So indicating a possibility of uh, formation of the warm skin. So uh, after a very uh, rigorous and the uh, uncertainty analysis, uh, which is not shown here, we select these 17.84 watts per square meter for the QC, uh, significantly greater than zero, mostly due to the uh, accuracy or the uncertainty of the ERA5 downward long wave radiation data. And uh, to uh, make sure the subsurface SST could represent the, uh, the SST at the the bottom of the skin layer. So we have to uh, select those uh, wind speed uh, greater than two meters at night and greater than six meters during the day for uh, well mixed conditions. So, and uh, <clears throat> after doing those, uh, we define the skin SST effect as the skin SST minus the SST at the uh, 0.3 meter. So as shown in the um, figure E on the left, there are some uh, calculated QC uh, above zero uh, or even reach up to 100 watts per square meter, uh, mainly concentrated about uh, 60 or 70 degree now. And the uh, figure on the right shows that the uh, in the conditions of the significantly positive QC, over 96% the skin effects are positive, indicating the uh, ex existence of the warm skin. So we would like to then to study some characteristics of the warm skins. The figure A shows that the warm skin is uh, related to the uh, positive air sea temperature difference. And so corresponding to the uh, positive sensible heat flux. And figure B shows that uh, most the uh, identified warm skins were under the very hu humid uh, surface conditions with the relative humidity about 99%. So corresponding to the uh, large and downward uh, latent heat flux. And uh, we did not find um, ex explicit uh, wind speed dependence on this uh, skin effect. And we found that it's overwhelmed by, by the uneven distribution of the air sea temperature difference, according to figure C. And also, the most uh, identified warm skins are under cloudy skies, which would result in uh, increased downward long wave radiation and uh, a smaller net long wave radiation heat loss or even a heat gain from the atmosphere to the ocean. So then figure E shows the, uh, the total QC effect on this uh, skin SST effect with uh, a strong dependence. So uh, then we have to consider the uh, solar radiation effect, since the um, the total he surface heat budget also include the uh, the fraction of the absorbed solar radiation within the skin layer, which is always like to be the downward from atmosphere to the ocean. But since due to the polar day uh, of this uh, seldom cruises, um, 
all the identified warm scale are actually during the daytime. So then we have to consider the solar radiation effect and we use the spectral solar absorption model by Gentleman in 2009 with the formula shown here. And we also use the, uh, the 0 0.06 as the surface air beetle um, due to the uh, cloudy sky conditions. And um, we find that the, um, according to figure F, the uh, incoming insulation at the surface mainly above 100 uh, watts per square meter. And the solar absorption in the skin layer is typically below 20 watts per square meter, as given in figure G, which is in the middle. And we don't find uh, a strong like uh, dependence uh, of the uh, warm skin effect on the absor absorbed uh, insulation, especially when it is uh, below 10 watts square per square meter, as shown in figure G. So figure H shows the uh, contribution of each component in the total surface heat budget. Uh, and we find that the solar absorption is not the dominant case, but uh, the turbulent heat flux, including both sensible and heat fluxes, are the dominant. Uh, factor for the uh, the formation of the uh, the warm skin effect. So finally, um, we also um, uh, find a very interesting thing is that uh, since we have the uh, the images uh, recorded by the camera on board the cell room, so we we found that most warm skin events occur during or shortly after the precipitations. So. Since the uh, the the uh, su surface air is uh, always uh, warmer than the the skin SST uh, for those uh, warm skin for those warm skins, and if we assume the uh, the rainfall the rain drop temperature is close to the uh, wet bulb uh, temperature is uh, close to the wet bulb temperature, uh, air temperature. And uh, under the uh, near saturated condition, the wet bulb uh, air temperature could be uh, approximated to the dry bulb air temperature. Therefore, the rainfall, uh, the rain drop temperature would be also warmer than the skin SST. Would also add, introduce an uh, additional part of the sensible heat into the ocean. So unfortunately, due to the lack of the rainfall data, we cannot quantitate, uh, quantitatively um, estimate this part of the, um, the uh, heat flux. And finally, we run, uh, we run some uh, model simulations using the ferro model uh, designed for the cool skin effect, um, which has been shown uh, to be uh, capable to simulate the cool skin effect in some previous studies. But according to the figure uh, shown on the left, the warm skins are not well represented by the ferro model. And we um, think uh, one of the possible reasons is that the, uh, the skin layer thickness would be uh, influenced by the uh, rainfall events, but which is not reflected in the ferro model, which is just strongly um, uh, inversely strong, strongly related to the 10 meter wind speed as shown in the figure on the right. So here are some take home points. Uh, we, uh, to sum up, uh, we identified some significant diurnal warming events and we think that the uh, reduced salinity uh, either caused by precipitation or the melting sea ice could like play an important part of the formation of this uh, thermal stratification at high latitudes. And we also identify some very, uh, uh, some warm skins uh, which were rarely reported. And um, the mean contribution should be from the sensible and latent heat flux rather than the solar absorption. And both the diurnal warming and the warm skin models should be improved uh, at, uh, or need to be re-established 
at the high latitudes. So the last part is the uh, since we have the uh, accurate, relatively accurate, seldom derived skin SST, then we would like to assess the accuracy of the MODIS sea surface temperature at high latitude using the seldom data. So here above shows the, uh, the retrieval algorithms of the uh, MODIS skin SST retrievals. It mainly accounts for the brightness temperature difference between the 11, 12 micron channels which uh, should represent the uh, water vapor absorption uh, due to the like the uh, different uh, absorption in the, those two ch channels. However, due to the uh, cold, extremely cold and dry conditions in the Arctic, um, the um, this virtual algorithm uh, will like um, meet some challenges. So. Firstly, we have to do the quality control and we exclude the measurements and for the cell room close to the sea ice and also limited the tilt angles. And also we only select the best uh, quality level zero and level one modus retrievals on both uh, aqua and terra satellites for the comparison. So for the matchup criteria, it's uh, the time window is within 30 minutes and the distance is within 10 kilometers between the cell and the satellite measurements. Due to the, uh, the uh, high resolution the uh, sampling of the cell rooms, which is as one minute, so there could be multiple cell room measurements right, matched with the same modus pixel. So therefore, um, we have to decide the, uh, the uh, one to one modus cell room matchups and we choose the distance smallest um, matchups uh, between the uh, modis and seldoms due to the um, more uh, sensitive to, to the, um, the, the spatial variation. So here shows the statistics for the comparisons between the um, seldom and the uh, modis retrieved skin SST. Uh, as the um, for different uh, cell drone cruises uh, and as in table one and for different quality level of modus retrieval in table two. So generally we s could see a, a relatively well agreement between the cell drone modus uh, comparisons but there are still some uh, scattered points and some large biases um, and also go back to the statistics um, the uh, two main things are very interesting the first one is the mean and medium for the uh, 1036 and 1037 are significantly divergent from each other with a, a large difference. And also, the total uh, modus and cell skin SSC difference show a significant negative bias. So we would like to uh, address those two questions in the, uh, for the next part. So, firstly, we want to exclude the possibility of the uh, systematic bias between the two cell room vehicles. So to verify this, we um, compare the uh, SST between the two vehicles within one kilometer separation, measured simultaneously at various steps. So according to this statistical table, uh, it shows that the, uh, they are generally uh, in good agreement. So. Um, even though for the skin SST with a relatively uh, larger mean and medium, uh, that could be explained as a, a larger variability in the skin layer. And also this 0 0.04 cannot account for like the, uh, the up to the 0.4K, 0.4K difference for the uh, uh, each, uh, for the comparisons for the each cell drone cruise. So since we include the possibility of the systematic bias between the two 
sold vehicles, then we um, consider will uh, consider the uh, the atmospheric conditions experienced by the two vehicles. So this uh, plot shows the uh, the figure A shows the on the top right left shows the histogram of the brightness temperature difference uh, uh, for the uh, two cell drones, the the for the modis and cell drone matchups for the two cell drones. And the figure B shows the atmosphere. Uh, the air sea temperature difference distribution. So we can see that it's uh, for the along those two cell drone tracks, the distribution of the either BT difference or the air sea temperature difference are significantly different. With the 1036, with more uh, larger brightness temperature difference greater than 0.5k and a smaller or more negative air sea temperature difference as well. So figure C shows that the brightness temperature difference has a clearly linear relationship with the ASTD, so which could uh, is consistent with the distribution shown above. So then we look at the vertical atmospheric distribution for the uh, matchups uh, along the two cell drone cruises. So the uh, fig map A and B shows the maps of the uh, air. Oh, sorry, it's not the uh, vertical distribution. So we still uh, would like to know why the uh, different distribution for the air sea temperature difference for those two cell drone. So the uh, map in uh, A and B shows that for the uh, 1036, there are more data concentrated uh, between the uh, 71 to 72 degree miles, uh, as shown in the uh, in the in the blue box, and also this is uh, demonstrated in the uh, bivariety histogram in Figure C on the right. So, according to our uh, previous diurnal warming studies, we have uh, run the high split model and proved that those uh, warm air should be uh, uh, originated from the uh, the, uh, the air heated by its passage over the land. So, therefore, for the 1036, it has more uh, positive air sea temperature difference samples. And then we look at the vertical uh, temperature profile from the MARA2 matched with the modis seldom matchups. As we know that the brightness temperature difference is determined by both the surface conditions and the, uh, the uh, intervening atmosphere between the sea surface and the satellite sensor. So according to figure A and B, corresponding to the water vapor and the air temperature profiles below 5,000 hectopascal, the um, experience, uh, the um, the both of them shows like a uh, like a significant difference between 1036 and 1037, with uh, a larger variability for the air temperature for the 1037, and also the specific humidity for 1037 is uh, significantly lower at the uh, lower troposphere than those. Uh, at 1036 on average. So the figure C shows the total column water vapor distribution are also uh, a, a homogeneous. So by running the r simulation using those uh, MARA2 uh, water, uh, the MARA2 vertical atmospheric profile, we find that the simulated brightness temperature difference shows a similar pattern at the uh, the satellite married one, as shown in the previous slide, with the uh, at the uh, 1037 with more uh, larger brightness temperature difference than 1036. So therefore, we conclude that such large difference in the statistic uh, should come from the uh, the different atmospheric conditions experienced by the, those two uh, cell drone vehicles.
And now we would like to study the error st character, some error statistics, and to uh, like uh, uh, ask why there is a generally negative bias for the modis seldom comparisons. So we still calculate the uh, Diana warning as uh, used uh, in the last section, and we find that the uh, the modis uh, seldom SST skin difference. Are has a has a, a clear uh, relationship with the Diana warming and the uh, modus SS retrievals uh, tends to underestimate the uh, as skin SST under the strong Diana warming events. So this is because the algorithm coefficients derived from the conditions, uh, which is uh, um, representative for those uh, strong Diana warming cases. So here, if we another thing is uh, another insight is, is that if we use the 0.3 meter uh, SST to uh, compare with the modis skin SST, the statistics will show a significant positive biases indicating the existence of some strong dynamic events and also it uh, indicates that using the subsurface SST to uh, assess the accuracy of the modis skin SST especially under those uh, with under the conditions with like strong dynamic events is very inappropriate and will lead to like misunderstanding of the error characteristics of the modis or satellite retrievals. So another thing is like, uh, based on my master study, I find that there is like an emissivity effect in the brightness temperature difference, especially when the, uh, during the winter time of the Arctic, when the uh, atmosphere is extremely dry and cold, uh, which means the uh, brightness temperature difference cannot represent the water vapor conditions in the uh, atmos uh, atmosphere so I um, introduced or I uh, established an index called E delta BT, the emissivity introduced brightness temperature difference, and expressed as the emissivity difference between the 11 and 12 micron channels times the surface temperature and the effect atmospheric column temperature uh, simulated by the RTTOV model. So this E delta BT is shown again to have a, a a significant uh, correlation with the uh, skin SST difference between the modis and the seldom, especially greater than one, which is very encouraging since this is the first time uh, this emissivity effect is um, validated by the, um, by the uh, in-situ skin SST measurements. So uh, here are some take-home points uh, for this section and uh, so it's uh, when we um, think that the large uh, difference in the statistic between the 1036 and 1037 matchups is due to the, uh, the different uh, atmospheric conditions experienced by the two seldoms, and we find that the inaccuracies in the modis retrievals could come from the uh, the strong dying warming events or the uh, strong the surface emissivity effect in the brightness temperature difference. So uh, for other work, I think my professor has uh, introduced those. Uh, uh, one is about the, uh, the effects of the Tonga eruption on the modest derived SST. And another part is like is the uh, characteristics of the R2019 reprocessing of the uh, MODIS uh, SST at high latitude. So this will be a more comprehensive study of the, uh, the matchup database in the Arctic region for a long time, a period of time. So I, may, uh, I will introduce this part in my final defense, so if you are interested in, so uh, you're welcome to come my final defense, and uh, thank you. Well, thank you. Um, 
Are there any questions to John, either in the room or online? No? There are many firsts here. It's the first time it's been shown that you can generate good estimates of the skin temperature of the ocean. The skin, the skin layer is about as thick as a human hair. <coughs> Excuse me. So you cannot measure it with a thermometer. It has to be done differently and that's where radiometry comes in. So first time that it's been shown that skin SSTs can be derived from a robotic vehicle unmanned over a period of 150 days. It's the first time that the effects of the different emissivities at wavelengths of 11 and 12 microns are, become important when conditions are very dry. It's the first time we've seen such large diurnal heating at high latitudes. It's the first time that the importance of temperature and humidity inversions in the Arctic atmosphere are preventing accurate SST retrievals. All of those are firsts due to John, so he deserves a lot of credit. <laughs> So thank you. Um, there is a question from Lev Looney. Yeah, I, I, I saw that. Oh yeah. So, what's the question? Or he will ask them. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, my internet's not the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Awesome. That that's this was an awesome talk, and uh, I look forward to. I think it was recorded, so going back through it and kind of there was a lot of stuff presented. So great job. Um, thank you. One question I had with looking at the the skin temperature because it's such a a thin layer. I may have missed it, um, but did you look at vehicle motion at all? For example, if the vehicle, I can't remember if you had the the skin SST, that device on the front, if at any point that the vehicle was moving, kind of what it was measuring was where the vehicle had just, where the sail drone had just moved over, and if that had a big impact. Um, that was the first one. And then the second one was, I believe the, the sail drone, I can't remember off the top of my head or from your slide, does it just have the, the one uh, CG instrument at the, the point 0.3 meters, or is there also one on the, the keel kind of at the one point whatever meters, a second yeah, one with yeah. the, the Seabird? I don't know if those vehicles that y'all used had two different depths on top of the skin depth. Um, and if you would expect, I guess, any major differences or correlations between the difference from the skin temperature to point 0.3 and then point 0.3 meters down to the uh, one meter, or if you would really just expect the same in the point three versus the, the one point whatever. So I guess those are two questions I've got. Great talk though. Thank you, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I may ask the, uh, your second question first. So I will try to back to the slide. Uh, let's see, uh, introduction. So yeah, I think uh, as you can see in the uh, green box, so there indeed has another infrared parameters at 2.25 meter. So um, I, I actually um, try to use this measurement to derive this SST. But the, um, I mean, the, there could be like maybe two ways. One is use the uh, sky measurements from the uh, CT09 on the deck. So at like the, that unicorn structure, um, infrared parameters. So use that uh, sky measurements to correct the uh, measurements at the, uh, the uh, 2.25 meter. And you may also have a, a skin SST from the wing. And I made that part of a discussion in my published paper as well and try to uh, compare the, um, <clears throat> the uh, skin SSD from the, uh, the infrared parameter system on the deck. Uh, but uh, one question is, uh, one problem is that the uh, things, the viewing angle are totally different for those two, um, like those two CT15s. So one is, as I mentioned, uh, when the cell drone is an upright uh, uh, vehicle, so the viewing angle for the, <clears throat> the uh, CT15 on the deck is 50 degree, but for the 
CT15 on the wing is only 7 degree. So that means the uh, receive, uh, it receives the uh, reflected downwelling radiance uh, from the sea surface actually would be like, could be like, different from that mirrored by the CT09 on the deck. So um, we, we cannot like actually evaluate this, how different, how large different would be, but we still like uh, did the derivation and uh, actually get a, 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 a SAT, SAT scheme from the wind. And by comparing the, uh, the this uh, SST wind and the SST on the deck, uh, we find there are some uh, large difference, especially uh, uh, at the uh, when the uh, the uh, sky temperature is is high or like uh, maybe uh, above zero uh, under cloudy sky conditions. Uh, so, but if it would like it would, if we would like to utilize this uh, measurements on the wind. Another uh, an alternative way is to uh, maybe run some radiative transfer model and uh, to simulate this, the sky uh, measurements uh, at the uh, at the actual effective incidence angle on the wind and to get the uh, the the, uh, the sky corrections for this part of measurements. But uh, I, I mean it's. Is still, I mean, very challenging. So uh, currently, we uh, mainly use the um, SST scheme derived from the uh, depth with like the whole the uh, the system of the uh, the infrared parameters. Uh, and uh, I think your the first question is like to uh, to look at the uh, the oceanic fronts. Or no, it was how many? <coughs> Go ahead, Lab. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say with, with the, the first question was regarding of, I know you, you talked about modeling kind of the, the vehicle motion, but what about if the vehicle goes, kind of what it's measuring, the skin temperature is where the vehicle just was. If the, the vehicle is moving almost the backwards, so to speak, or if that even happens, um, where you would have the skin temperature you're measuring is what was just mixed up by the, the vehicle itself and not by other normal physical factors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, it, it could be. I mean, as I saw, I think uh, for the uh, the some specific dynamic events and for the second one, I think the pattern of the so you may see there are some you know large oscillations right in the figure B so yeah it, it's very likely it, it could be like caused by by the vehicle itself rather than the, the, the tilting effect so it's like uh, this is from my perspective it's still unclear and also it could, it could also uh, due to like the uh, the unsalted layer uh, caused by the melting sea ice and actually the density stratification is not very stable at at those periods of time, so when the the uh, the uh, a seldom passed by, and it could like cause some external mixing, and resulting in some you know this oscillation because it's like has some strong oscillation during a very short period of time. So it's it's very like yeah, it's very rare and uh, hard to explain. But uh, yeah, I think yeah that's my explanation. If I can just add a little bit awesome, there. Thanks. Um, yeah. The unicorn configuration is on the bow looking ahead. So, and it's a sail driven vehicle. So it's quite unusual for it to go backwards. And we do have very accurate GPS. So one could look into that. Did it ever go backwards? Um, the diagram here shows uh, what we thought was a really interesting event, the people at Sail Drone Inc. who are steering this thing, they put waypoints in, were mortified at the thought they had rammed an ice flow and in fact it got stuck. So for a period, what is happening here of course is the ice is melting and it's coming again in the direction along the drone from bow to stern. So I'm 
I think what we're measuring there is uh, probably, well, it's a very complex situation. I don't think anybody has ever taken measurements in this particular type of situation with this sort of uh, configuration of thermometers. Um, there's always more work to be done. Awesome, thanks. We should uh, throw some of these, these sensors and setups on the, the hurricane sail drones. Yes. And see how the skin temperature changes in hurricanes. Yep. Yeah, indeed. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and thanks once again to John. Thank you. Thank you.